Hello everybody and welcome back to On The Spot STEM. Today we're going to be going over induction and inductance, which is chapter 30 from Halliday Resnick Walker's textbook, 10th edition. The first concept to know is magnetic flux, which is measured in Weber's or WB. So the magnetic flux is simply the amount of magnetic field times a certain area. So for a completely flat surface in a uniform magnetic field, the magnetic flux is given by B times A times cosine theta, where A is the area of the surface in question, B is the magnitude of the magnetic field, and theta is the angle between the normal vector of the area and the magnetic field. Now if we have a curved surface, all we need to do is take an integral of this. Gauss's law for magnetism states that in a closed surface, the integral of magnetic field over area is equal to zero. Magnetic flux is used in Faraday's law. So Faraday's law states that the EMF induced in a coil of n turns is equal to negative n times the change in magnetic flux over time. And Lenz's law, which is part of Faraday's law, states that the induced current has a direction such that the magnetic field due to the current opposes the change in the magnetic flux that induces the current. And that's represented by the negative sign in Faraday's law. The direction of the current can be determined by the right-hand rule. So in this example, the one on the left, when the magnetic south pole moves towards a loop, the magnetic flux is originally pointing upwards. But when the magnet moves closer, the magnetic field that the magnet produces, that the ring feels, goes up, which means that the magnetic flux pointing up will also go up. And since the induced current wants to oppose the change in magnetic flux, the induced magnetic field will be downwards, which means that by the right hand rule, the induced current direction will be clockwise, viewing from above. Here's an example where you actually have the calculations of each of these. So when we have a rectangular loop and we're pulling it out of a magnetic field, the EMF is simply the change in flux over the change in time. And that can be expressed as BL dx over dt. And dx over dt is velocity, which we represent as V. So then we get the EMF equals BLV. But what's the force that we need to exert to keep the loop moving at the same speed? Well, the current induced is the EMF over the resistance. So that means I is equal to BLV over R. And since the force is equal to ILB, the force is simply equal to B squared L squared V over R. To figure out the direction of the current, we look at how the magnetic flux changes. So when we're pulling the loop outside of the magnetic field, there's less and less field lines going through the loop. And since the field lines point inward, the change in magnetic flux would point outwards. And by Lenz's law, the induced magnetic field would have to point into the page, which means that the current would be clockwise. Another form of Faraday's law is when we take the closed line integral of something. The EMF is given by the line integral of the electric field over a certain distance. And if we plug that in into Faraday's law, we get the closed line integral of E ds is equal to negative d phi over dt. This is always true, however it's only useful in certain configurations because of the great deal of symmetry. Next, we'll move on to inductors. So inductors produce a magnetic field out of a current. An inductance measures how resistant an inductor is to a change in current. In a circuit, an inductor is represented by the diagram on the top right. And the equation for inductance is given by N times the magnetic flux over I. Let's see if we can find an expression for the inductance of a solenoid, which is the main inductor that you'll encounter. So the inductance of a solenoid is given by L equals N times the magnetic flux over I. Now B, the magnetic field that a solenoid creates, remember, is mu naught Ni, which means that the magnetic flux is BA, which is mu naught Nia. And big N is equal to little n L, because N is the number of turns per meter. So if we plug those all in, we get L equals small n L times mu naught times n times i times a all over i. And if we simplify this, we get L equals mu naught n squared L a. So self-inductance also appears a lot. So remember, inductance is given by n times magnetic flux over i. If we rearrange, we get n times magnetic flux equals L i. 
And from Faraday's law, we get the induced EMF is equal to negative the change of n times magnetic flux over time. If we plug it in into the second equation, we get the induced EMF is negative the change of Li over dt. And if we simplify that, we get the induced EMF is negative L times di over dt. This is an important equation to remember and know how to derive. A very important circuit is RL circuit. So that's when a resistor and an inductor are placed in a circuit, and an EMF may or may not be included. So to find the relationship of current over time, we have to use Kirchhoff's law. So when the RL circuit is charging, the switch would be at A in the diagram on the right. So if we start with Kirchhoff's law, we go up an EMF of E, then we go down negative IR, and then we go down again negative L di over dt. And since by Kirchhoff's law this has to be zero, we just get E minus IR minus L di over dt is equal to zero. Now we can do some calculus and solve and we get I is equal to E over R times one minus negative t over the time constant, where the time constant is L over R. Similarly, for discharging, when the switch is at B, we just get negative IR minus L di over dt is zero, because the EMF is just not included in this circuit. So solving, we get I is equal to EMF over R times E to the negative t over the time constant, where the time constant is the same. Now this equation is only true if the inductor is connected to the EMF for a long time, and the initial current starts off at EMF over R. However, the general form, if the current starts at I0, is I0 times E to the negative T over the time constant. RL circuits appear frequently, and it's very important to know how to work with them. The last thing for chapter 30 is the energy of a magnetic field. So the energy is stored in a magnetic field when a current flows in an inductor. So here's how we can derive the energy stored in an inductor. We start with V, which is the potential difference across an inductor, is equal to the inductance times di over dt. That was our previous equation. Now if we multiply by i on both sides, we get vi is equal to li di over dt. Now vi is simply power, so we get power is li di over dt. And since power is the change in energy over the change in time, du over dt is equal to li di over dt. Then we can cancel out the dt's, we get du equals li di, and we take the integral and we get u is equal to one half li squared. And that's the energy of an inductor. The magnetic energy density can be calculated by dividing the energy that we found, u equals one half li squared, by the volume. We're not going to show how that is derived, but the energy density is given by b squared over two mu naught where B is the magnetic field. This is very similar to electric energy density, which is one half epsilon naught times E squared. You'll notice how there's a one half, there's the constant, and there's E squared or B squared in both of them. Now this next concept is in chapter 31, but it's worth lumping it into chapter 30 because it's so similar. So when a capacitor and an inductor are placed in a circuit together, the charge of the capacitor and the current of the circuit oscillates. And this is in simple harmonic motion. So we'll derive this using the equations below. Recall that the energy of an inductor is 1 half Li squared and the energy of a capacitor is Q squared over 2C. So the total energy of this circuit would have to be Li squared over 2 plus Q squared over 2C. Now since there's no resistance in this circuit, when we take the derivative of U over time, we get the power which is equal to zero. So if we take the derivative of both sides, we just get Li times di over dt plus q over c times dq over dt equals zero. Now since i is equal to dq over dt, we can cancel that out from both sides, and we get L times d squared q over dt squared plus 1 over c times q equals zero. Now the angular frequency can be easily gotten from here. Omega squared is 1 over LC, because if we divide by L from both sides, we get the familiar simple harmonic motion equation, and omega is defined that way. So next, we take the square root of both sides. Omega is 1 over the square root of LC. So using this, we get the charge and the current. The charge over time is equal to the maximum charge 
times cosine of omega t plus phi, where omega is 1 over root LC and phi is the initial condition. And we can find i by taking the derivative of q over time, and we get negative omega q times sine omega t plus phi. All you really need to remember about LC circuits is that its simple harmonic motion with the angular frequency equal to 1 over the square root of LC, where L is the inductance and C is the capacitance. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe for more AP Physics videos.